so feel free to uh, scoot in a little closer. The chairs scoot really easily, so it shouldn't be too much of a thing. Okay, that counts as closer, I'll take that. <laughs> so basically how it's going to work is I'm going to give a kind of brief review of some of the literature on representation in American politics. Uh, then start talking about some of the ways you can actually get in touch with your legislators and ensure that said rep a representation actually happens. Uh, then give some more kind of general advice on that. And uh, throughout this all, uh, if you have any kind of best practices you want to share, stories you want to share, questions, feel free to just uh, kind of shout it out. Okay, so starting from the, uh, the very beginning, one of the first pieces of American politics literature to be written about this was written by uh, Mayhew in uh, 1974 called The Electoral Connection. So it's basically a review of what members of Congress do and how this ties into any electoral goals they might have. And the kind of cynical takeaway from that is that the sole uh, driving factor behind members of Congress is that they are, here's the exact quote, single-minded seekers of re-election. So that's not a very happy thing to think about initially, but when you consider uh, if your goal is to try and influence your member of Congress, they can actually be a massive help to you. So consider the fact that your member of Congress knows that the successful pursuit of their goals requires their continual re-election, and the biggest part of that is not making their constituents, y'all, unhappy with anything they do. So if you're thinking about uh, getting in touch with someone that who's in the legislature is about to be a, a legislator, make it clear that this issue will impact your vote and make it clear that this is something you'll consider when it comes to the election time because it, at the end of the day, they are kind of counting on you no matter what else they want to do. And a, a later piece of work on that was done by, uh, by Fenno in 1977 uh, entitled House Members and Their Constituents. So this person uh, literally followed around members of the House in their home districts for about 10 years. So going to their meetings, uh, walking around with them, uh, spending time at their house on weekends and seeing how they interacted with the, uh, the close advisors they had. And one thing you learned was that members of Congress have a, a constituency that they consider to be divided into essentially concentric circles. So like their district, um, the people in their party who uh, they figure will re-elect them, a smaller group of people who they consider their uh, primary constituency, that, so the people who support them in their primaries, and then the uh, much smaller circle of uh, actual post advisors. Um, so they get their most reliable support from people who vote for them in the primary. So this is another avenue that you really have. So especially if you can credibly say that you supported them in their primary, that you campaigned for them, um, then your opinion will matter a massive amount to them. So that's another thing to essentially make clear when you're getting in touch with people. Uh, later on in 1990, uh, we had something kind of, uh, titled The Logic of Congressional Action, which uh, still held close to this idea that re-election is the main goal of legislators. Um, but also uh, kind of added on to that, that whenever legislators act, their first goal is to think of how will voters react to this. So not, not so much to say that uh, like everything they do, they're trying to do it like the exact way people back home would want, but rather if they expect opposition, then they'll avoid doing that. So the key advantage you can take here is that you can let them know that there is and that there will be opposition. And they will, they will take you to that mostly because they just they're people like, like you and me, they don't want the bother of having to try and convince everybody that the one thing like, everyone disagrees with is actually a good thing. So you can definitely use that to your advantage as well. Another slightly more negative takeaway here, though, is that if you're not actually their constituent, your opinion might not have terribly much weight. So it's very fun to try and uh, contact, say, Ted Cruz's office or try and contact Marco Rubio's office and make yourself heard on these issues. But if you're not from Texas or if you're not from Florida, it's not, while it's not necessarily hurting your case to get in touch with them, your opinion doesn't matter very much at all. It, it might matter if it's, like, if it's paired with a lot of people, if there are thousands calling into their office that day, but if you're just looking to go out and make a quick impact, you're much better off uh, contacting your local people. Yeah. So I just want to say that actually, so I live in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and actually there was an instance where people calling from out of state, or the perception of people calling from out of state actually actively hurt the cause. So Pat Toomey, the Republican Senator for Pennsylvania, used the flood of phone calls to claim that people from outside Pennsylvania were calling, and that their office claimed that they were using outside area codes as an indication of whether they're calling from outside, of course, belonging to the fact that everybody has a cell phone associated with yeah. them in 1999, and then basically spun that as a reason for him. Now, by the way, real Pennsylvanians can get with me later. Yeah. So I think actually at this point, like it's extremely cynical, but I think it's actually burning. That's a really good outside. point. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I've never seen anything like it, and some staffers that I've talked to haven't really either, but that's where it's coming from. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, yeah. yeah. 
I do face that exact problem myself because I live in Pennsylvania, but I have a Massachusetts cell phone. So I don't really have any good way during the day to actually make the calls that I want to make because I'm either calling from New Jersey or I'm calling from Massachusetts. So I think what you do is you just literally say, hi, my name is, my zip code is, and at least the staffer that I talked to said that that's how they're going to, I mean, and just make it clear that you're calling from an outside phone, but you have a zip code and you live in the district. So, I mean, to the extent that we can believe anything that we hear from the other end. But that is really nice software. Most people actually, oh, They have software to keep track of their constituents, so I, I think that that should work. Yeah, when you do call, they do potentially record the uh, the area code and things like that. But if you do tell them your zip code, you can easily kind of get around that. But at the same time, it's also a bad idea to like don't take this to mean that you should look up what zip code happens to be in the district you're about to call and then tell them that. So this is not an encouragement to go that route because you you will slip up at some point. It'll be kind of embarrassing, and you do not want to be like on the news as the person like you called a hundred different offices and gave a different zip code to each one because essentially these offices like are right next to each other in the capital. So it's someone's going to notice that. Uh, one last little piece of literature, and I think the most heartening one, uh, comes from pretty recently in uh, 2011. So some folks uh, down in New Mexico, um, there was a, a ballot issue, or not a ballot issue, um, there was a, a, a state budget surplus that had just recently been announced, and the uh, governor called back in the state legislature to decide what to do with it. So this is a very kind of quick turnaround sort of thing. There's about a two-week window between the, when they got called back and when the vote was going to be happening about what to do with this budget surplus. And so these uh, researchers did a very quick uh, poll of the uh, constituents in each different uh, district in New Mexico and selectively shared those poll results with different New Mexico legislatures or legislators. And the ones who had received that polling info actually voted very consistently with their constituents. And their voting behavior was significantly different from the people who hadn't received that information. So keep in mind that at, at the end of the day, uh, these members of Congress actually do want to vote in the way their constituents want them to vote by calling them and telling them what your opinion is or emailing them or sending them a letter, at the end of the day, you are doing them a favor. So always keep that in mind, uh, no matter how discouraging things can get when you're trying to get in touch with folks. A slight caveat to this is one of the reasons it worked so well was because it was that kind of snap issue. So members of Congress, especially folks in the Senate, uh, may have already polling data. So you might be trying to call them on, say, uh, immigration reform or healthcare reform they may already know that, say, 60% of their district feels a certain way, or 70% feels a certain way. So one of the ways that you can be the most effective is on kind of snap issues like these. So for example, with the recent uh, controversies uh, surrounding Trump, uh, one of the big ways you could you could potentially make a difference with that is by calling in and asking, say, whether you like oppose or support investigation on certain uh, things that have come up, because th these are issues that literally haven't had time to generate polls or members of Congress haven't had time to go back to the district and hold town halls. So these are the areas where you can actually have the biggest amount of impact. And in the other area, that's not to say you shouldn't contact people about the other more longer term issues, but it should be exactly that, a longer term thing. So letter writing, going to these events, and accepting that things will take a while to sort of turn around on those. So with that, I'm gonna kind of switch over to talking about the methods of contact you can have. So I'm going to talk about uh, phone calls, emails, letters, and actually showing up in person, and uh, some of the different benefits and disadvantages that these things can have. So first of all, with phone calls, if you're calling into the policy opinion, you'll want to call them at their Washington office. Now, our friend Google actually will give you pretty much all the content information that you need. You just look up their, uh, uh, if you're in the Senate, their Senate.gov website. Make sure you avoid the, uh, the campaign one, because that'll just have um, the phone number of some office in an office park somewhere that was temporarily set up. Uh, for constituent services, you can try the local one. Um, that's like if you're calling not about um, you want them to vote in a certain way, but you know, you'd like the flag that flew over the Capitol on you know, your grandmother's birthday or something like that. So a lot of things that are much easier to get done uh, but that, that do not necessitate a call to the, uh, to the main office. Uh, one key thing for phone calls is plan ahead and collect your thoughts and make sure you stay calm. It's very, very easy for um, whoever's answering the phone to just dismiss your opinions. Uh, if you, I guess, a rant is a bad way to put it, if you sound uncollected. So make sure you kind of jot down your thoughts and collect yourself. Uh, especially given the uh, kind of highly impassioned nature of a lot of the issues that we're facing nowadays, it's very important to kind of maintain a calm, cordial sense of yourself when you're having these conversations. You make a much better impression, and you have a much better chance of not being dismissed as, a, oh, that crazy nut job who just called us. And one small thing, especially for phone calls, and especially recently, be very prepared to just leave a message. 
So no matter who you might call, odds are pretty good that you might just get kind of shunted off into a voicemail system. Is that a question? Well, go ahead and finish the message. Oh, I was going to say, you, you'll probably get um, kind of pushed off into a voicemail system, especially if you're not calling like between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, when whoever the intern they have on the phones is is actually there. Yeah. So my, my question is, you said to call the D.C. office, but because they've been flooded, yeah. right? If you can't get through to D.C., you're saying leave a message, they count, do they actually listen to those and count them? Uh, they actually do. So. They might not listen terribly closely, uh, which is something I, well, it's something I kind of get to later on, but they, they do listen to them, they do tally them up. Uh, it is something that is gotten to. It's it's worth a shot calling into the local office if you do get pushed into that automated system. That was my question, is it is it better to leave a message at DC or to then like hang up and call the local office and tell them there? Because I've called local offices and they'll, they'll take your opinion. I, I would do both. So the one disadvantage for the local one is, especially for a quick turnaround thing, it, it might not just get the chain in time, or if, even if it does at all. So if you're like the only, like if you're like one of maybe five or so people who actually calls the local office on a given day on a given issue, it, it might not even like kind of make it up the chain that folks are calling in about that. So I, I would err on the side of leaving a message at the at the main one. Yeah. But I mean, there was a period like a few weeks where when Robert Menendez's like voicemail was full, like right after the. That's yeah. So that. that that does happen occasionally, and that's you're, you're kind of out of luck for calling in on the phone. Then when that happens, there's not really much you can do. So for that one, you can try local offices. It, it's worth a shot, um, but if, if it is full, then I, at, at the very least, it suggests that other people are calling in, which which should encourage you, I guess. So that should be nice. Um, so again, the advantages here are it's a very good option for sudden issues, things that have just came up, because you can get your opinion to whoever answers the phones and they can get it to the legislator in a very quick turnaround. In addition, it's probably the lowest time commitment out of anything you can do. So if you add in the time for kind of collecting your thoughts, writing things down, and navigating the phone menu, um, you can do one of these calls like in one or two minutes. You can do it every day if you truly care about the issue and like, you really want to make sure your voice is heard. So this is something that is very time effective. Uh, the phone numbers are incredibly easy to find. So members of Congress might not have their email addresses listed out. They might not have information for how to like actually get to their office or meet with them, but every single one will have their DC phone number listed. And if they don't, um, both the House and the Senate have full lists of phone numbers available if you just Google House or Senate phone numbers. And the final thing is it's very difficult to ignore. So unlike emails that just kind of pile up or letters that just get put in the corner, even if they don't pick up the phone, you are literally making a noise in their office. So that's one thing to definitely keep in mind. And that a uh, that comes back again for the importance on quick issues. So members of Congress might not notice terribly much, but they will notice if the phone in their office is ringing off the hook all day long. So that's a quick, easy way to get through to them. The disadvantages are, like, like was mentioned, you may have to leave a message. The voicemail box may be full. Like you mentioned, it's very easy to filter people by, uh, by area code and just kind of ignore them that way. And one other thing is it can be kind of stressful. So you might be in contact. You might be like the 100th person to call in that day. You might end up talking with a kind of snarky intern. You might, and uh, the issues themselves might be such that, you know, when you realize that you're actually getting to talk about them, uh, it might induce a lot more stress about that. So that's one or one other thing to plan out. So if you think this is an issue that, you know, you might not be able to help yourself in like getting really impassioned about, it might be better to go for the letter route or go for the email route or something like that. But moving on to the email side, I, I meant to have a big picture of uh, Mike Pence up here for this section. <laughs> um, the legislators' website will almost always have an email listed, and they almost all also have an option to submit comments. So I, I can't actually speak to what system processes uh, those those comments, whether it's a similar thing. Um, but the options there. One thing to note, uh, kind of like phone calls, do not write them when you're angry. It's, it never it never goes well. Uh, so there was there's a saying that a friend of mine had that uh, if you think about what you're about to say. Think to yourself, is this something an asshole would say? And if they yes, do not say that thing. And that goes double for emails and anything that'll end up in print. Uh, and one other thing, a lot of the activism groups will have uh, templates, scripts, things like that. Try and individualize it at least a little bit if you're going to send in something like that. So it's like the uh, flood of phone calls from out of state. It's very easy to dismiss a script thing. People know that those take no effort at all. And if they see that and they think people don't even care to write their own message, they're probably not even going to read through it. So like I said, the advantages of these, it's very, very low stress. There are a lot of templates out there. It's incredibly easy for a legislator to tally, or for the intern to tally more likely. 
So it's even quicker than phone calls and things like that. And uh, another advantage, kind of from the cynical side, it's very difficult to filter out who is or who is not their constituent. So if you actually are trying to get through to someone who you might not be in their constituency, they can't really tell this way. So it's, I guess normatively, this might not be the best if we're interested in representation, but if you want to make your voice heard, this is a good thing to kind of keep in mind. And the disadvantages, there aren't really too many. So one is it's not bad ideal for kind of quick turnaround things. So as you are all aware, inboxes tend to just pile up at a certain point. And on a similar note, legislators will probably receive many, many, many of these, and it's very easy to get lost in the crowd in a way that's not quite true for some of the other ones. So for letters. I have a question. Yep. For the emails, would you say, like, being lost in a crowd, I mean, I know usually people would rather read, like, three sentences than, you know, five impassioned paragraphs about why you oppose this. Yeah. So would you prefer to, like, skip the template and just make a very formal, like, address? and then three sentences that are very clear and concise, Definitely, yeah. almost like you're talking to them. Exactly. So one of the things is they will be going through trying to figure out and distill into a, a couple words what, a, what your goal is. So trying to be as specific as possible is very good. And I guess like if you're writing a letter and you, you have like a full story to tell, then that, that's one thing and you go ahead and tell that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're just trying to like make your voice heard real quick, you want something that can be distilled into three words. Don't vote for X, okay. something like that. So similarly with the letters, they should go to the DC address and their, their website should have the address there. And similarly, you can easily look up a list online of all the addresses for everyone in the Senate, everyone in the House, all of your state legislators. The event is here, it's very fun to write as a group activity. So if you're looking to have like a bunch of people getting together and discussing activism, it's very simple like to sit down for a few minutes and uh, write these letters. Uh, another cool thing, you might get a letter back very easily, which is a cool thing to have. Also, a physical stack of letters makes a huge impression, and a much bigger impression than a full inbox or a full answering machine. And also, a lot of groups, similar emails, will have templates you can kind of use to base yours off of. So again, don't send the exact same thing because that gets really easy to spot. Um, but it, it can help you. Some disadvantages here are that it's not very well suited to sudden issues. So with the uh, current Trump happenings, um, if you're looking to try and impact a vote on whether or not to investigate some issue, that vote may have already taken place by the time your letter gets there and is read. It's also a, a much higher time commitment than emails or calls. It has an actual physical cost, unlike a lot of these things. And again, it's even more easy than phone calls to, uh, to filter on non constituents here. And finally, in-person contact. So pretty much every legislator's website uh, will have something called either office hours or a way to get in touch with them to have a meeting. Uh, so, for example, uh, Cory Booker, if you go to his website, you can literally fill out a request a meeting form. And I, I can't speak as to whether or not you hear back from this, um, but it, it's actually there. Uh, similar, you know, many senators have uh, just days of the week where you can stop by. Uh, there might not be too many, but I know uh, North Carolina, um, where I was working on a campaign for a good while, uh, the senator there, had, I think every other Tuesday, uh, her office was in D.C. was just open all day for uh, constituents from North Carolina to come visit. And, this wasn't the most convenient thing because it was in D.C. for North Carolina constituents. So this, the being in person might be kind of difficult, but it's a good option. And also, if you keep an eye on a local party websites or local news, you can find out about events and town halls where you'll be. And this is kind of the highest visibility thing you can do. So other advantages, like I said, this is the potential for the biggest impact. It's amazing for registering your opinions on long-term issues. So if you have opinions on something that will be evolving over time. This is a great way to kind of slowly get your voice out there and let them know that this is something that people are thinking about and that will not go away. And this is far and away the most fun. So you actually get to go and do a fun activity with your friends and get some uh, some uh, political impact at the end of it. Uh, disadvantages being it's also by far the most time consuming. Uh, it's almost impossible to do on short notice. And similar to other ones, these can also just be ignored. So if you've seen recent examples of uh, members just canceling their town halls, because they don't want to deal with their constituents. Just like the uh, full voice boxes, there's, there's really nothing you can do about that. And ending on that very happy note, um, we have some, just kind of, some kind of general advice. So first thing is that be persistent. You will encounter full, vo uh, full voicemails. Um, you will encounter very difficult to find addresses. You will encounter legislators who cancel uh, meetings or cancel office hours. Um, one thing, go as local as possible and stick to 
we'll try and stick to uh, members that actually represent the area that you're in. Your vote or your voice will have a much bigger impact that way. And there's no wrong way, but there are some that are more appropriate for different situations. Another key thing is uh, be careful about playing the university card, particularly the, uh, the Princeton card. Um, so when I was working on a campaign in North Carolina, we learned very quickly that uh, if you call into rural legislators and tell them that you're from the university, um, they'll either laugh or they'll just hang up right then. So there are some are a university. Um, Princeton in particular, I would I would try and uh, don't make yourself very easy to dismiss as just an ivory tower liberal or just uh, some kind of isolated activist. Um, there are some where it'll help you. So if you're calling a Senator Booker or Senator Mendez, feel free to bring that up. Feel free to mention it, but just kind of consider the context uh, before you try and do that. So if you're especially if you're trying to call out of state. Um, I would try and just keep that down though. Maybe say you're a college student or say you're affiliated with a college, um, but just kind of be careful about that. Another is just try and stay cordial. It makes you that much harder to dismiss. Uh, be as very specific as possible. So when someone reads through your emails or your letters uh, or goes through the messages that have been left, they're not gonna you know, write a nice little summary of it. They're not gonna you know, just get an index card or anything. They're gonna like add, a, like add another check mark like to the box that says immigration. Or like another check mark says someone called like about healthcare issues. So try and make it, I'm not saying like that's like a one word email, but try and make it so it's easy to distill down to those points. Also stick to one thing at a time for the exact same reason. If you have a lot of things you want to talk about, send a lot of letters or make a lot of phone calls, but make each one about kind of one discrete thing so you can actually have a better chance for impact. And finally, again, be persistent. So there are going to be a whole lot of uh, difficulties to this, uh, calling uh, and realizing that the office is closed and there's no one there. Uh, things like that will happen again and again and again. So just don't give up on that. And remember that if like one senator's office is closed, you can call the other one or you can call your house member or a lot of different things. So any questions? Yeah. Um, is there any resources you could recommend to tell sort of what they're, I feel like there's kind of a laundry list right now of here's the 12 things that are being discussed from education to affordable care, but sort of what to focus on first um, in terms of like what order they're taking them, or is it more important to make the Affordable Care Act calls this week or the education? Um, I guess the one thing I'd recommend is kind of keeping an eye on the, on the national news and kind of like getting an idea of what all is on the, uh, on the agenda. So in terms of actually talking about specific issues, if you look at uh, your legislative website, um, they'll have like a news section that shows what they're working on right now, and even more importantly, they'll have a list of uh, committee assignments, so you can kind of tailor what you're saying to uh, that, that specific person. So, for example, uh, if you look at uh, Cory Booker's website, you can see like what Senate committees he's on, and uh, you can actually kind of consider like do I want to be in contact with him or uh, would Senator Menendez's uh, committee assignments be better suited to looking at the issues that I really want to focus on? That's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah. So, so could you or maybe anyone else share a specific experience where you called and what was the issue and who did you call and did you feel like you made a difference and what happened? Okay, so I'm, I'm from North Carolina. Um, my senator, Richard Burr, is on the in Intelligence Committee in the Senate. Um, I called about uh, three or four times. Um, each time, um, actually, yeah, twice the message said that the office was closed, even though it was about 4.30 in the afternoon, and I got put onto a voicemail. And then two other times, it just went directly to voicemail without even saying that the office was closed. So I, I left messages each of those uh, each of those four times. And uh, I guess since like shortly after I called, I'm, I'm sure this was entirely unrelated to my call, and he actually did put out a statement uh, with regards to the uh, Russian investigations. So that was the subject of my call. I guess this I, is very I don't mind went through, but it's someone must have. So this is fairly recent, yeah. If anyone has any, yeah. Uh, uh, first, I wanted to ask sort of like. Uh, for resources on this stuff, like uh, have, if you if you haven't heard of the Indivisible Guide, I think it addresses this. Um, it says that in particular that calling like on one specific issue in a very time like when it's very timely is something that makes a lot of impact. Um, so I do have a story, I guess. Um, Wait, can you repeat what you said at the beginning? Uh, it's the Indivisible Guide. Um, okay, uh, right. I, I called. I called my representative, uh, Republican Dave Reichart, uh, about the which state? Washington. It's 
one, it's like right in between the Seattle and the farmland in the east. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, I called him to talk, or talk to one of his office aides about the immigration ban. Uh, it, I think that went well, and some things that made it went well is like I started off by thanking him for some something he had done that I did approve of. Uh, he was working on like making sure dreamers don't get deported. Uh, also, I had like a personal story. Like I had a friend who was directly affected, but or his parents, his parents uh, were. Uh, who had a valid visa and spent years trying to get that visa uh, were not allowed entry anymore. And um, I think that really, or the staffer told me that it was very, uh, like, she's, I, I think she said it in like this very sincere way, like, it's good to know that people are actually being hurt by this. Um, so like, I guess like if someone's skeptical, then like a personal experience, if, if you expect the representative to be skeptical, then a personal experience would help. That's a good point. Yeah, so a lot of time members might think like my constituency doesn't really care about this issue, it doesn't really affect them. And your call or your letter can actually get through the point that yes, people actually care, people actually are affected, and it will come back to haunt them if they let this keep happening. So, you, sorry, sorry, about your story, you talked to an actual person? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm in Leonard Lance's district, which is north of here, um, and have called several of his offices several times and spoken to several different staffers. They're very nice, they always ask where you live, like they're looking for the town name, not for a specific unit because they want to make sure it's in his district. And um, yeah, it's always been really great, but it, it helps to just be calm and it also helps to know if you can if you can say what the bill that you're calling about is and the bill number, mm -hmm. right, that seems to help a little bit too. Do you so, feel like you made a difference? Um, in his case, well, the thing that, well, I don't know, you know, when you make the phone call, right, they just go, okay, we'll pass that along, right? You don't, you know, you don't know how many other phone calls they're getting, yay or nay, on whatever it is, right? Um, but I did go to one of his town halls last week, so, last week, two weeks ago, whenever it was. Um, so, that, I feel like just having the number of people there who all seemed to be saying the same thing to him did make a difference. And how did you find out about the uh, town hall? Um, I kept an eye on his website. Okay. Yeah, um, and they posted them there. Um, and it turned out like the he's had one so many you had to RSVP to that one just to say you were going to be there, but they had so many people interested that they ended up having two and ticketing and all kinds of stuff. Oh, wow. So, you know, my daughter and I were fortunate enough to get tickets. Um, so, and he was very cordial during the whole thing, and it was and the, some of the people in the audience were not, <laughs> but he took it pretty well. So, so yeah. So, there were so many hours in the day, <laughs> uh, you know, the work full time and all that. And so I've been feeling it's just sort of like I'm chasing my tail on the notion of if I get in touch with, with uh, a representative who's from my own party, I'm probably echoing what they already think. And if I get in touch with a representative who's from the other party, they're probably just going to ignore what I said. So how does one break that? cycle of feeling like, I don't know, like, where to keep in mind, especially if uh, everyone who represents you is someone you agree with what they're doing, you can also just call them up and they're like, you know, I support what you're doing, like, keep on fighting the good fight, and let them know that what they're doing is supported and is needed and is wanted by the people who they're representing. Another thing is, even if you're not um, represented by those people, just letting them know that people like you are out there like who want this certain set of things and are not going to just forget about it uh, is, is a very important thing. But yeah, just calling them to know that you support what they're doing can be just as impactful as calling someone and telling them to do something else. As related to that, um, I also called uh, a Democratic sen Senator's office and basically said, like, oh, you know, I'm usually a little bit uh, moderate, politically moderate compared to most of Seattle. But, uh, uh, but you know, this administration is not something, you know, you, you know, you, you all can just do whatever you need to. And I, that sounded like it really uh, had, like, uh, that staffer also had a, like, I think, emotional response to that. <laughs> can we 
think the other thing to notice is that it's not necessarily as black and white. Like, it's really easy to think, like, of course, this person is just going to be filtering and have, like, blinders on and looking for con like confirmation that people are supportive of policy that they want to support. But, it, like, it's definitely not the case. And there's definitely a very wide range of opinions on the number of policies that are up for discussion these days in terms of education, immigration, financial structures, healthcare, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not polarized. Um, and so your opinion is certainly not, you shouldn't be afraid to speak up if you think like, oh, I'm just like clearly speaking with the status quo or, oh, like I have no way to add my voice to a dialogue when everyone's just like, you know, confirming what they think they already know. Like it's really important to think like, you know, even if there's some sort of critical mass around a certain opinion that you want to you want to say, like, actually, no, there is some, there, there is a group of people, I'm one of them, that doesn't believe in this particular policy. Um, That's a fantastic point, yeah. And, like, more to your point, like, your member of Congress might support a certain bill, but if enough people call them, that might be the difference between just kind of their passive support and then actually, like, willing to put in a lot of work and make sure that thing actually gets through. Mm -hmm. um, so just letting them know about that, even if they're all exports, it, it could still make a massive difference. I have kind of like a silly question. Like I know you mentioned like keep watching the national news to know like what they're voting on, the bills and everything. But like I mean, I'm actually like finding out more information on Facebook which bills that they're like trying to vote on this week because Facebook's I'm not resource. seeing it on news because of these bigger schedules <coughs> yeah. going on. So is there like a website that there's an exact schedule? I'm sure this is a really silly yeah. question. I have one. Accountable? Accountable? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else know about that one? Congress, the Library of Congress, I think, is the host of the, of the official website for scheduling everything. So, yeah, one, one should be able to find absolutely everything there. One would certainly hope at least. Is the formal website for uh, commenting, is that regulations.gov? I, I believe so, yeah. So, first, main comments on like, actual proposed regulations. And I've heard that that's very important to use that because that is oh, admissible in legal actions. Oh yeah, especially because I, I know I used to work at somewhere that uh, the person sitting there at the desk next to me worked on uh, environmental regulations, and by law uh, she had to read through every single one of those comments, like summarize every single one. So if there is a really specific uh, regulation that you have concerns about, please do submit a comments because I guarantee they are being read. Yeah. But then, how does this respond to them, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, we have to have a fair response, yeah. So it's just like, <clears throat> no, this doesn't make sense. Uh, a lot of the time it is that, sadly, yeah. But I mean, literally every single one, and it's, they probably get read like, a lot closer than uh, any email you might send to a member of Congress. That, that's a fantastic point. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. What's the website? I believe it's regulations.com. I think so, yeah. And it, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but it, 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 can you find what the okay, so Part of the process for governmental regulations um, is they have to go through a comment period. So the entire thing, which could easily be like a full thousand page document, is available. Every for, bill in Congress. Um, not bills in Congress, but a, um, executive branch or regulations. So, for example, like if the exactly. Department of Energy is going to put out um, some new set of regulations, it has to, it's 30 or 90 days. They have to be publicly available for comments. And like was mentioned, literally every comment must be read and a response must be created for it, even if it is just like, this is silly. But they they will be read. They will be considered. They will be reported up the chain. That's what it is. Awesome. So regulations not good. Thank you very much for that. And to your point, the more individualized they are, the harder they are to skip over. Otherwise, they exactly. get lumped yeah. together and tallied without consideration, further yeah. consideration. Yeah, definitely. It's since they are submitted online, it is very easy to spot the kind of form of submission and very easy to just kind of glaze over the eyes and put the same thing. But any individualized one, it will stand out and. I, I, yeah, I can't repeat enough, they will all legally be read. And if, if they're not, then we have legal issues to deal with that are much bigger than any comment. <laughs> that would be a scam. Do presidents pay much attention historically to, uh, to the comments. calls and comments and emails and whatnot, or is it just so uh, overwhelming? That the comments on there, it's, it's at such a kind of lower level that the people who are fond of that sort of thing, like, it, it more is their job to deal with that specific issue area. And especially given like y'all are all pretty knowledgeable people, you could easily know quite a few things that people writing those regulations either didn't think of or didn't quite realize. Um, so a lot of times it's very helpful stuff that does get actually written in. And at the very least, 
um, there will be some kind of documented record of a, a comment being rejected. So you can go back later and say, like, this should have been done, this wasn't done. And you can start a whole process after that. On a side note, the, the historical record is that there are certain presidents that have paid a lot of attention to personal letters that are written to the White House. Mm -hmm. um, there are stories of um, FDR sending money to families that asked him for money during the Great Depression. Um, I have a little bit of an anecdote. I'm Canadian, but my aunt is a um, green card holder in Mississippi, and she was having a mental health issue a number of years ago, and I felt helpless because I come from a country that has a federal mandated national right. healthcare system, and she had no way to get assistance at that point because she was unemployed and not on disability. Um, and uh, I, I emailed the president's office, so I was like, I don't know who a representative is. I'm Canadian. I don't know anything about American institutions. And I sent a letter, and a couple of months later, I got a detailed response from a White House staffer. Oh. Um, it wasn't necessarily as informative in terms of where I could go for resources as I would have hoped, but it was certainly like someone had clearly taken the time to read it, to write something, um, and that this was a part of like a, a broader agenda, obviously, at the time on, on the Affordable Care Act. Um, but yeah, the, the track record certainly is that there are these crazy anecdotes that come out that you know, somewhere someone is reading letters or you know a certain cut point of them get passed on to the president when he reads them, whether or not Trump will read them. Yeah, but but it's, it's another question, but, but it's still really important. And on that kind of same note, one of the uh, really underused aspects of members of Congress is every single one will have several people in their office dedicated entirely to constituency service. So their entire job is helping you navigate through some issue with the federal bureaucracy, whether it's like a lost passport or something like that. So a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, one of these uh, people spent about half an hour on the phone with her was walking through the entire process. Um, for I think like a family member like lost their green card or something like that, like an actual like a serious thing. But they walked her through the entire bureaucratic process. They followed up. Um, so it's it's a really underused resource, um, but that one that every member of Congress cares deeply about being able to provide because it's it's in their interest that you have a very positive experience with their staff. Yeah. Along those lines, if you come from a state that's purple, would it be worth actually going after the legislator from the other party? Going through the constituent services, the next time you want to complain about something, you can say, "By the way, remember how you helped me." Oh, easily, yeah. Like, it, and it would definitely help. Like at the beginning, like of your talking to like, "I have such amazing like, experiences I had with you." Like, by the way, like as someone like who's been helped by you and appreciates you, like this is how I feel about such a certain issue. Like, your opinion will be a lot. There will be a face to the opinion, which could help that a lot. So that's that's a very good point. If there's nothing else, uh, I think there's dinner downstairs pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for uh, for turning out for this, and uh, feel free to call slash write slash email your member of Congress. Mm -hmm.